first up, a story which suggests that our asylum system is completely unfit for purpose. It's now emerged that the Clapham chemical attacker, Abdul Azidi, received a full Muslim funeral, despite claiming to have converted to Christianity in order to remain in the UK. Court documents have also revealed that a judge accepted Azidi was a Christian convert, despite concerns the sex offender was a proven liar. And the Home Office has warned that the reputation of Christian churches could be damaged if they are viewed as undermining the integrity of the asylum system. Well, we can now speak with GB News' home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, the case of Abdul Azidi seems to crystallise everything that's wrong with the broken British asylum system. And the news today that Azidi, who claimed to be a Christian, instead has been given a Muslim funeral, many, Mark, are seeing as the final insult. Yeah, I mean, I think the asylum system as a whole, uh, potentially it does indeed... Uh, it cast some serious shadows over that. But in terms of pointing an accusatory finger at the Home Office on this occasion, I think that finger of blame probably should be pointed in other directions. The Home Office can be criticised for a lot of things, but on this particular occasion, when Abdul Azidi came illegally to the UK in 2016, the Home Office assessed his asylum claims and didn't believe that he was fit and proper to receive asylum and twice refused him asylum. Uh, in terms of the sexual offences he committed while awaiting his asylum decisions, well, that was a judge, an independent judge, and not the Home Office that decided that he should not be jailed on that occasion. And then what you had, uh, what the Home Office have been warning of for some time, is an industry of individuals and organisations from charities and human rights groups to immigration lawyers and to uh, members, influential members of the community like clergymen and women uh, coming forward and willing to go into bat for asylum seekers when they've been refused asylum to try to get that overturned. And this Abdul Azidi case appears to be and a, um, a perfect example of that where twice the Home Office said that he should be denied asylum and removed from the country, others intervened. And on this occasion, that judge, again an independent judge in Newcastle, who decided that this asylum decision should be overturned, based his evidence on the evidence of a clergyman, um, Roy Merrin, a reverend former Baptist minister at the Grange Road Baptist Church in Jarrow near Newcastle, who had baptised Abdul Azidi, who had written to the judge who had testified in person to the judge who had provided pictures of the baptism and also of Azidi handing out leaflets, Christian leaflets in the local community. He had said that he believed that Abdul Azidi was an upstanding member of the church, that he was sincere in his conversion to Christianity. And the judge was swayed by that. The judge was swayed by that, incidentally, despite acknowledging that Abdul Azidi's character was one of deceit and lies. A man who, when he came here first, claimed that his brother had been shot dead in Afghanistan, only to change that story later and say that his brother was killed in a bombing attack. He also said when he came to the UK that he was a Shia Muslim, only later to change that to admit that he was indeed a Sunni Muslim. And he claimed that his conversion to Christianity would mean that his family was at great risk, were at great risk in Afghanistan and offered no evidence as to how they would even have known or anyone who would have done his family any harm would even have known about his, Christ, uh, his conversion to Christianity. Despite all of these things, the judge was swayed by the evidence given by this member of the clergy. And that's what the Home Office feels that it's up against all of the time, this industry of individuals and organisations willing to go out on a limb to try to do what they can to ensure that asylum seekers are allowed to, allowed to stay. And when you've got people like Reverend Roy Merrin, who incidentally is refusing to comment today on this saga, 
Uh, he is an individual who has some standing, of course, in the community and who a judge will take quite seriously the evidence that this uh, minister was giving uh, to that appeal hearing. So uh, on this particular occasion, while there's plenty we can point the finger of blame at the Home Office for, I think the finger of blame probably should point in other directions, Martin. Mark Wyatt, an excellent and comprehensive summary as ever. Thank you for joining us on the show this afternoon. And joining me now is Michael Phillips, consultant lawyer of the Christian Legal Centre. Welcome to the show, Michael. You may have heard it there, Abdulazidi, a serial liar, a sex offender, um, lied twice, denied asylum, and then had a miraculous conversion to Christianity. A judge decided to believe that. The Reverend Roy Merrin decided to believe that. And then we find out today, Azidi has had a full Muslim funeral. His family clearly didn't believe he was Muslim. Why did that Reverend believe him? And what does this say about Christianity? This man seems to me no more a Christian than I'm a Martian. Yes. I think in some ways one can have a lot of sympathy with this particular judge and also maybe even with this particular reverend. I think that there's a real lack of understanding as to what it is to be a true Christian, not only to be a true Christian, but somebody who's moved away from Islam. Um, because people who really do move away from Islam, and I've met one or two of them, I've been to these tribunals, I've seen people give expert evidence in these kinds of situations. But in order to really become a Christian and move away from Islam, it, it in fact, it involves a renunciation of Islam. And so I think it's one thing to stand in a town centre, to hand out some leaflets, maybe even to get baptised, even though that's obviously a very important step. But it's another thing maybe to publicly say that I renounce Islam, I renounce Muhammad, I renounce Allah. and and I think that if you had to do something like that in those circumstances, I think that that would really uh, separate the wheat from the chaff because there's going to be very few people who are going to want to do that if they are not truly converted. And when mm. I read through the, the 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 questioning that this man went through at the Home Office, I, there was no heart in it. There didn't seem to be any love for for who Jesus is. And that's essentially what a Christian is. It's somebody who's fallen in love with the person of Jesus Christ. And he was just giving very short and terse answers to the questions that, that were put to him. And anybody who reads his cran transcripts can see, okay, maybe he made a few mistakes here and there. But did he really have a relationship with Christ? Well, um, I, d I certainly don't think so from the answers that he gave here. And But unfortunately, it seems as though he managed to at least convince one person who had a lot of who was given quite a lot of weight by the judge who heard the case. Michael, do you think that the perhaps well-meaning notion of wanting to believe that there's good in everyone, wanting to believe that there's a Christian spirit in everyone, no matter what their past, can actually be a damaging thing? And do you believe in this instance that we must get to the nub of the matter? We've heard repeatedly now from Matthew first saying there's a conveyor belt of these conversions going on. And do you think this needs to stop? Do you think we need a full investigation? Because surely you must agree this is damaging the Christian church. Um, I think there are a lot of people who will say that they are Christians and they're not really Christians. And the reason why that is, is because there's so much persecution of Christianity around the world. Um, not only in, in terms of total numbers, but in terms of the total proportion of people who are persecuted for their faith. And it's very easy to, uh, to hide behind that statistic. And I've seen it myself on countless occasions. And I think what we really do need is that you need good evidence. And I think that judges are aware of false conversions. And indeed, I've, I've heard that myself firsthand from judges that they're very skeptical about particular clients. But in amongst that, there are people who truly do convert. And I guess the fear is, is that if we uh, say no more regularly, those people who do, uh, do truly convert may well be sent back to places like Af to Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, where they will face certain death in those circumstances because the penalty for leaving Islam is death. And that is carried out, maybe not obviously in this country, but in certain parts of the world, that is carried out. And so my fear is, is that for those who do truly convert, that they are able to stay in this country and are not smeared by obviously people as, as dishonest as, as this man was. And yet, Michael, there is also the, the very real and grave danger that there could be how many others like Azidi who are gaming the system, are using the good heart of those they see in churches, reverends, whatever, ministers, priests. 
they're abusing the system, they're, they're gaming the system, and that has consequences. Do you think? What do we do? I mean, you said we, we, we beef up the, the procedure. They must publicly denounce Islam. Is that one potential solution? Because at the moment, yeah. they seem to say one thing and do another. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen this myself. Um, I, I've seen this in terms of some of the people that I've met who say that, you know, very shortly afterwards, after they've got the, the visa in, 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 their, in their passport, I'm no longer a Christian. And so it is a common trick, which, which is allowed. And in fact, within the religion itself, within the religion of Islam, in certain circumstances, you are allowed to say things that you don't truly believe if you are in a difficult situation. So they can even justify it from a theological point of view. So, I mean, I think that there does have to be this beefing up of the questions, but also that, that, that there really must be a real heart for the gospel that comes through in any person who truly professes to know Christ. And sometimes the way in which I've, I've noticed it in people who do truly convert is you see it in their social media, which can be seen around the world. They say, I'm now really a Christian. Look at this. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And and then it's available, you know, the, the relatives in Iran and so on can see it. And then in those circumstances, you know, that person really is a convert, because if they were to go back to, in, to Iran, they almost certainly would face death. And they say, look, you know, if I go back to Iran, then so be it. That is the Lord's will. And you think, OK, you are really a convert because you're prepared to face death. Whereas this chap obviously was not prepared to do that. OK, Michael Phillips, consultant lawyer of the Christian Legal Centre. Thank you for joining us and giving us an honest and heartfelt response there. Thank you very much.